Okay, hello. Um, so it's been a bit of back and forth of me trying to get this video together. I tried really hard to make it as clear and well edited as possible. So I really hope it's okay and that it makes sense. It is quite a long process. Um, I will timestamp each of the steps that I put up on the screen in case you want to go back to them. So that'll be in the description. Now, this video isn't going to be down the about the knocking down part of terraforming mainly because everyone is going to have a totally unique space and have knocked down different things so most likely it will look something like this photo with you know big uneven chunks from your hammer and or golems and bombs so what we are going to focus on is the aftermath of clearing a space so what do you do when it looks like this um, the process can seem intimidating to start. Um, it seems like, you know, there's so much to do and where do you start, but we're just going to take it one step at a time and you'll be surprised how efficiently you can get a large space done. So this space on and off playing throughout the day probably took six or seven hours. All right, so let's start. So we need to make a plan and envision what we want to do, but sometimes it can be hard with nothing to work with. So now this early stage, we don't want to worry about changing the terrain type. We'll do that when we're more certain of the plan. So to start, let's just have a look around, see what we're working with. Um, for this project, we don't have any plan yet, so we need to get uh, inspiration for one. What we want to do is, like I just said, look around. So I'm seeing the riverbed up here and I'm leaning towards an oasis theme at this point. So I'm going to knock down a section on the left, get that river to flow down into that space. That's my little bit of inspiration. So we're going to block the water off just for now because the water is just, it's something you want to put in last. Um, but we can use that idea to start making a plan. So next thing is I'm actually just going to quickly throw down a pink chalk line to give me an idea of how big the space I'm going to be currently working in will be. Um, depending on what you're doing, this can help feel, you know, help it feel a little less overwhelming if it's a huge space. The space I'd knocked out is much larger than this, but knowing I'm just working in that space makes it a little bit easier and I can always extend it out later. All right, so now we can start making a plan. At this point, think of your plan as a like a fluid concept. By that, I guess I mean you don't need to be super attached to your initial plan, um, but this is the equivalent of putting down, you know, the first brushstroke on your canvas, the first note of a song. It doesn't have to be what it ends up with. It's just something to inspire you to start. So stepping back and having a look at this space and trying to pull an idea out of it, we want to work with what we have, not against it. So by that, I mean, looking at this space, we can see up behind it is that river that you create for the story when you initially arrive back on your Isle of Awakening after Farrowfield. So I went up to have a look at that area and saw a very sort of just a very small space where water would come through easily so I knocked out a few blocks had a look and the water flows pretty well into that depressed space on the left so that made me start thinking about like an oasis area so I went on Google and started looking at images using a few words that came to mind when I was in that area so I started looking up cliff lake cliff oasis lagoon palm tree cliff, um, looking at pictures and, and the space and comparing them, I decided a lagoon oasis area on the left would definitely work. Um, I wasn't sure about the right at this point, but like I said, because it's more of just a general concept, not a plan plan, it doesn't have to be fully formed before you start. So the left is enough to start with. So looking at that left, I think I want to taper down that space under where uh, the water will come out there. And I want it to look like sort of a natural rock platform sitting at the bottom of the cliff. And I want that depressed area where the water is running into to be the sandy, the lagoon part of the oasis, the water. Um, and I'm thinking it's probably just going to be a cliff behind the oasis, but probably a little bit indented 
so that we can, you know, have some greenery and um, vines hanging down. Um, I think at this point as well, I want palm trees up on the cliffs to kind of cut the area off from all that sort of blankness you can see behind it. And I figured at this point, as that top, the top of the cliff is actually, you know, a riverbed. So it does make sense to have trees in that environment. When we get further into floor, flora and fauna, um, we'll talk more about placing stuff where it makes sense, not just where it looks good. All right, so just quickly from here, I'll refer to the trees, bushes, flowers, etc., as a whole, as flora. Um, if I'm talking about just the trees, for example, I'll say trees. Um, but it's easy to just talk about all the greenery as flora. Um, now, quickly, I just want to talk about getting supplies um, as well. At this point, you'll want some terrain and flora to help formulate this plan. So uh, getting supplies is kind of intertwined with making a plan because you want to look at those biomes. So I was thinking about an oasis, and so then I decided to go to the sunny sands, have a look at how those oases look, and grab a few of those supplies to see if the oasis theme would look good on on the project. Now that we've got some of these supplies, we just want to put down with the trowel, if you've got it ideally, um, in a really basic way, an idea in terms of terrain of what we want it to look like. So I'm going to throw a bunch of sand down where I know I want it to be the lagoon. Um, and a little bit of grass over on the right, even though I'm not sure exactly what I want it to be, I know I want it to be grass over there. So we'll throw down that and then we can start making it more rounded, but to do that we're going to have to do our line theory. Alright, so to start chipping the space out so that it actually looks nice, we're going to have to do a little bit of line theory. So, what this is, even though we're chipping out a space, we need to understand how to make a good line. So, here we can see this doesn't look smooth. We're just trying to go in a curve, but it looks straight. So, once we start adding lots of twos and threes in ascending or descending order, We'll start to get a better curve. So if we go down three, two, one, one, we're going to start getting a curve. But then if we want to go back the other way, we need to go two, two, three. If we want to keep going on towards the left, we need to go back down to one and then up to two. Now you can with this as well, it's not always going to be one, one, two, three. We can see down the bottom here I've gone two, one, three, but you're not going to jump numbers that much. The more you do this, the more you'll get a feeling for it. You can do tight curves like this, and it will still look like something. But again, this is because we've gone one, two, one, two, or here we've gone three, three, two, one, one. So with this idea, we can make curves tighter by then pulling the numbers back down by one, and we can make them looser by putting the numbers up. So we can see the straight part at the top's got the most blocks, and then we've gone down on this side, say, we're going down two, two, one, one, we've gone across three, and then depending how many we go up, the line is going to look different. So why we need to keep this in mind, even though we're chipping away, is because we want the edge to look like this. So it's better to understand how the line works before you start chipping it out. So I'll just quickly, I'll fill this in and then we're going to use that same theory to chip the area back out. So when you're chipping stuff out, it is definitely, it's not usually the very first line you do will be what stays. It's, it's work. It's, you've got to sort of chip an area down, then chip it down again and again and again. So say here, it's just a square. So we just need to give it to start some depth. You want to chip out an area, start tapering it down, even if it's just on one side. Again, when you're working with really blocky structures, just work with what you've got. Start connecting it to the areas you want to connect. First in just big long lines and then taper the lines down like this. So four, three, three, two, one towards them. Cut off sections, fill them in. 
and then keep doing that process and connect the areas as you go. You can just work around, but I to personally just to keep it a bit more fun and interesting, like to move to a new area and then go back again and connect the areas. But see, once we started with this less curvy line, as we're going along now, we can sort of just get more and more out of it, keep chipping it away, and it'll become a better line. So from here, we can start doing that to this area. So what I'll do with this, it was hard to work out how to show you because it's obviously a really long process for a big area like this. So I'm going to try and cut between some slightly sped up parts, some normal speed parts and some fast parts just so that you get an idea. I don't want to cut all of this off too short, but I don't want to be just showing, uh, you know, 14 minute stream of me doing this block by block. So as I had mentioned, I want this area up where the water is going to eventually come out to have a sort of flat rock platform off the edge of the cliff that's kind of cutting off the lagoon from the green area a little bit. So here is where it starts to feel a bit daunting to do a task like this. There is all of that space and I'm sitting here doing this one block and it feels like it's going to take forever and it does take a while, but I can only say that it is honestly very rewarding once you start getting it done. And if you just stick with it for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you'll look back and you'll be surprised how different that part will look and that will kind of entice you to do more. So here, this part is because it was such a big space, it didn't have to be perfect. Like I was saying in the line theory part, I just needed to connect one part to the other to start. And then once I start filling that in, I can start curving it up using that theory and making it look more natural. So now that everything is starting to smooth out, we need to add some landmarks and definition. A quintessential little island in the middle of the lagoon is a good place to start. So now we can start thinking more about the terrain types. We know the lagoon is going to be sandy, but they'll have more terrain types than that. So by doing this island, we can think about what the base of the lagoon is. We need a solid base that matches the cliffs. So I'm going to use sandstone for the few bottom layers around the lagoon area. And I decided that this part is going to be a nice little inspiration for what the rest of the area will look like. So I made it look nice and added all the different types of terrain. And from here, I need to start getting the job done of filling that right side of the lagoon and making it look more sensible. Now, a tip when filling in big sections like this, it's good to use a disposable block you won't need or you can make a lot of light coloured chalk. Um, it means that you're not wasting hundreds of sand or dirt in the centre where the blocks can't be viewed. Um, I use cyan a lot as it contrasts everything so it's easy to see what you're doing. Um, and once I've got that general structure down, I can trail over it with the sandstone and sand and I'm wasting a lot less of that more important material. So once we've got a nice looking shape for the lagoon, like I said, it doesn't need to be 100% perfect, but we're definitely trying to get it more towards the final structure. We can start working out, again, a bit more of the plan. So I am going to grab some wooden uh, logs, the ropey ones, and put a border roughly around where I had put the pink chalk to section off the area because I figure I want this little oasis to be like a private area. I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do with it, um, but it's going to help me again to find the space.
So far, I've been focusing on just this lagoon and the sand around it, but now that I've put the fence down, I can start building up around the inside of the fence and working out what parts are going to be the water and what parts will be the shore. Because um, we'll need to fill in this ourselves with water, we can pick what the water level is. So I've just kept going around and around, level by level, doing our smoothing. It takes a while. I'll need to dig into the lagoon at some point to make it deeper, but that isn't important now. Um, here I'm starting to feel like I need to move on to do some of the cliff behind the lagoon so I can work out what that back part of the lagoon is actually going to look like before I dig it out. Personally, I think the cliffs here are harder to fill in than these flat surfaces just because they're trickier to the eye as it was. Um, now, the first thing you need to start doing here, I think personally, is matching up the terrain type. So I am troweling out all these bits of sand and arid earth and stuff so I'm not left with stray blocks while I'm working. This isn't necessary. Um, I know I did it the other way on the flat surfaces using the cyan to fill in, but uh, for me, I would prefer to have the right terrain when I'm working on a cliff in the middle um, because there's more chipping out here than on a flat surface. So you're more likely to be uncovering if it was colored chalk, a lot of colored chalk and having to replace it when you're doing a cliff. Um, whereas in a flat surface, you kind of already know where the line is. So I think it's usually a best idea to do most of the inside of a cliff with the terrain you're using. And so to start, you need to follow a similar theory to your line theory, um, but the jumps in the numbers are going to be higher because we want it to look a little more jagged and you're working in a 3D space. So you're not just doing it across, you're doing that theory across, up, forward, back, etc. So my advice here is to try and overcompensate, try and overfill a bit. You can always chip it back down. Um, it's kind of pointless, I think, in a 3D space to try and make it perfect off the bat because you're going to have to keep standing back and going, mm, having a look, chipping out, adding. So overcompensate, you can make it a little bit bigger and then chip out as you go. And as you get practice at this, you'll need to overcompensate less. And I mean, the other thing that, with it being a 3D space is you come across multiple types of fixing required um, and you're going to need to use multiple techniques. So the big chunky blocky spaces, we're going to start chipping them out to be just a real basic gradient for now and then what we want to start pulling each of those horizontal levels we've created from that gradient, we want to start pulling each level of block towards the area we're filling and down towards the ground. So it won't stay like this in most places, but it's a good way to start building a 3D space. So now you're building up a flat shape and here in this little right corner, we can start making that a 3D space by filling in some tall, taller sections in the sharp corners and rounding it out and tapering it down Again, using that line theory, but in a 3D way, we're going to do it across, up and down. So for the cliff itself, I had mentioned I wanted it to have a bit of a recess in the back. So instead of just filling this area totally down, we want to fill the top, the bottom and the back to look good while keeping that bit in the back a little bit hollow. So we'll start with the top. This is going to be something that's really hard without the build binoculars, unfortunately. It is doable, but it's just a lot harder because you need to be looking up. Um, so you're just going to need a lot of scaffold if you don't have them. Um, but it's doable because um, what we want to do is we want to create like a stalactite effect, um, sort of randomly coming down from the roof in lines of two or seven. So we just want to look up and just start all over placing two and two, three, four, five, six, seven. We need to do this all the way to the back, not just at the front, because um, we don't want it to look flat. And we want to start tapering those lines down at the back to be slightly longer than they are at the front so that they curve back into the wall. Now, I have the two holes where the water is coming out, so I just need to make sure either to not cover them or go back up and chip them out when I'm done. And the very top I noticed while I was doing this is very flat and boxy. So I've just added a few levels of block on top. It doesn't have to be perfect right now because we need to go up and terrain that whole area. But just so we don't forget, I'm going to add it later. 
At this point, you might start doing stuff like this if it's a large space. So I'd say feel free at this point to move from one step back to the other if you feel it's required, just when you see little things that need fixing. Now, to start um, making the sides smooth. So a good way to start this is to create a map on the ground of where the last block of cliff will be and then start building that back towards the wall, just kind of like you're doing levels of terrain. Now we're just going to kind of use that as a guide to where we're filling in the sides. So now I'm going to go up one by one, making sure this bit connects to the already done pieces on either side. And from here we can then just start filling up that middle part like we did on the little curve on the right. Just going in that 3D way, one up, one down. Um, adding more blocks to the inside corners just so it becomes a softer curve. So once you've done all that, you need to start stepping back and having a look. Um, you'll probably need to go back and forth a bit, like I said, chipping out here and there. But once it looks pretty generally like it should, we can move on because we'll do a final clean up later. So now we can, like I said, step back, have a look. This part I think is starting to look pretty good. So I want to move on and do the other cliff now. Like I said, they're the hard bit. So once you get them out of the way, everything else is going to seem a little easier. All right, so this cliff is a lot bigger than the lagoon cliff. So we'll need to break it down into more manageable sections. Like the lagoon cliff, we need different techniques on the different sections, depending on how they've been sort of cut out. I've decided I want a recessed area on this right part as well. So to start on this side, we'll, we'll quickly go through that same process as before, but we want to add some features like we've done with the lagoon with the island. And we want to do those before we start the recess so that we can connect them up. So before we start, I want to make that area that's above the recess a little feature and kind of like a stalactite so that it doesn't mirror the other side. So to do this, I've worked with what we had like we did with the last part and I've bolted it out just in a square and then started chipping it back down on each side using the line theory. So this is where it's probably a better idea to start something like this after you've attempted a 3D space using the line theory because you're going to need to chip it down, tapering down, going up and then in ways on each side. So before we start on the recess, now that we've done the feature, we need to get a semi-correct idea of where we're going to be connecting the recess to. So we need to start chipping out the big flat space between this feature and the recess and making it look more cliff-like. We need that because like with the back of the lagoon, we need lines that are at least semi-correct in terms of their 3D spacing to join up to. Otherwise, we're still going to have those deep corners that won't look right. So to help create that flow, we're going to start chipping down the chunks that jut out. You're usually going to find these where you've cut out big sections with a golem. So we want to start tapering them down towards where the recess is. It doesn't have to be perfect. So we start tapering those in and then bringing out the corners that go in ways with lines of blocks. So it's going to start looking more curved. And then by flicking back and forth between those, we're going to get enough variation gradienting down to the recess to see how the cliff's going to be shaped. Once we have done that, we're going to have to clean up and gradient that rock platform and start connecting it to the recess as well. In the same way as the lagoon, we want it to work on the sides and the top first and then create a base for the bottom and start pulling that out and working the corners in towards you. If you start from the bottom, you end up with a much more boxy square structure on the top. So from here, I'll put in the recess that's gonna look a little like the lagoon side, but a bit more, um, like a little deeper. I'll have about a solid minute here just of me filling in just in case my explanation hasn't made sense here. I'll put in about a minute now just of filling so that you can get an idea if it, if it hasn't made sense up till now.
So like I've mentioned a few times, it's a long process, um, but it is, it's slowly really coming along. Like this has taken a while, but the cliffs are really getting to a point where they're looking good. So now we can work on that flat side of the cliff and we want to work on the top as well, sort of start tapering that into more natural shapes, which hopefully we're getting used to with our terraforming at this point. And then start, see what I've done here is just made straight lines and then start chipping them out and then I'm going to pull down blocks from the top and from the bottom and then start chipping out in the middle and we're going to have ourselves a bit more of a decent structure so I won't go too much over this smoothing now I'm hoping that that's probably enough I think you guys get that part we now need to move on to talking about our flora um, so I will put behind it some just some footage of me placing down terrain and flora but this is going to be less about what's on screen and more about understanding the concept from here. All right we're over the hump so we've done really the hard work from here we're going to need supplies like extra terrain and a lot of flora. Uh, at this point, we should have an idea of what we want to go into the ground. So before we start, we need to make a palette. We need to talk about that. Um, and so to do that, we're going to have to take a minute to ask ourselves what we're putting where and why. So we need to think about what makes sense in nature. By that, I mean it's unlikely that you're going to have a forest that's full of mushrooms, rocks, plants and flowers all in one area. Uh, to go away from where we are for a second, as an example, in my camping forest over at Sandy Highlands, which is Cerulean Step, I decided the following. It snows at the peaks to about a third of the way down the mountain. This means pine and birch wood grow up there, but plumberry pr trees probably don't. The ones that do are withered from the climate. Um, only snow flowers are going to be at the top and no mushrooms because they're not going to grow in the cold. But at the bottom, there's a lot more trees, there's less snow, so you have plumberries and birch wood. In theory, though, there's still not a lot of light on the ground, so we're going to have mushrooms here and green plants to decorate around the trees. Um, and the flowers are going to be less in the middle of the forest and more towards when you get to the clearing, towards the city path, because they have light. So if we take this idea to where we are, um, what we want to do first is make sure we've laid down the correct terrain before we start laying down the flora. So we need to get the idea kind of right before we start. So for this space, as I mentioned at the start of the video, there is a river running behind the cliffs at the top. So like the photos we looked at at the start, it's not unreasonable to expect trees could be at the top of this cliff. Um, and they'll be tropical trees. So the trees are going to need to be rooted in earth, not stone most likely. So we need to go down and lay down some layers of earth and grass all the way along the top, just a few blocks worth. This will also help us come back in a sec and easily place down all the trees at the right height because we know we can add them wherever there's grass. Now we're just going to quickly jump over to my flower shop in Sandy Highlands so we can have a look at some of the vegetable flowers we can use. These are a little bit harder because they're not in your Builderpedia. You need to catch them at the right stage of growth and take them out of tilled soil. So here we can see I haven't got a full shop yet but I've started putting in some of the things that are pretty. So I'm going to pick a different, few different types of white flowers here and what I need to do is go back over to where my palette is. I'm going to grow these in some tilled hummus, keep an eye on them, pull them all out and we can't mallet them. We have to be really careful. It's a good idea to place them last and we need to just manually place them around. And so because it's hard work, I don't usually use them a lot. They're just accents, but they are really fun to use. So now we can pick our palette. To start the palette, we want to think about the colors. As a side note, if you're doing flora after buildings, you want colours that are going to be complementary to the colours you've already been building with and the ground around it. But for us, we're starting with a blank slate. And so we want elements that will complement the trees, but not take them over because we want it to be nice and green and lush. 
So I've placed down a few flowers for the palette, but not too many different variations and not too many colors. We want them to pop and stand out, but we don't want them to overtake everything else. I've put down a lot more ground plants rather than flowers. Um, and I figure these will also be able to grow on some parts of the stone cliff. And I want vines for those recess areas. So I've made sure to add them to the palette just to check that they sort of match. Um, so we're going to want to grab a few of everything and then place it down like this. Those elements should all look relatively nice together for it to be a good palette and for you to be able to spread all those elements out and be confident that they're going to all come together in the end. Alright, so now let's start placing everything down. This will take a while in a big space. In this place I needed about 100 trees all up for this. So I try and take a little bit of time placing the first few trees. Um, think about where your paths are, even if they're down below and what direction people will come from. You should be sort of standing from and looking from the direction that people are going to be coming towards the area. So start placing stuff down just in one of those green sections. And so once I've done an initial section and um, been able to sort of step back and take a look, it's good once you're happy with that to just dive in and start doing that just a lot without thinking all the way along the top there's no such thing as too much because you can always just remove them um, i generally will remove a few from each of those little spots because i tend to go a bit mad and also you want to make sure that you're placing them in different directions so that they're not all facing one direction now for the ground plants and the flowers from the palette we can grab some of those and start placing more so the scrub stuff um, on the just a few around on the stone parts of the cliffs and then on the earth layers that we might have around where the um, grass is we can place the flowers and more of those bushy scrub elements um, in terms of the flowers a good rule of thumb is to pick one or two colors for a flower within a palette that are relatively similar or at least on the same side of the color spectrum and then something that'll contrast and for every you know four or five flowers or whatever the main color is you want to do a contrast element so that's why we've just got those few red flowers around because they contrast the green but we don't want too many where you can see them quite sort of boldly next also is the vines so the vines in theory can be added with your binoculars your build binoculars just by looking down at the right angle but honestly i find it more cumbersome to get the angle right than just adding shifting sands so if you add two layers um, they will both disappear when you stand on one so it's easy to place vines like i've done here just quickly as well with the lagoon i know i didn't talk about how I dug it out but obviously I just graded it down so I feel like at this point you've probably heard me say that enough um, but if anyone has any questions about it please let me know. Now the lagoon. For the lagoon I have a lot of reeds um, and rocks and I've put some debris and kelp elements on the bottom to make it look more interesting. And Quickly as well, just a little bit about uh, using the half chisel. It is very much just line theory and you can go around and just give some things more depth. It's up to you whether you want to do this or not. I like doing it in some areas, generally just the more natural areas, but be aware obviously your plants aren't going to place correctly on those. So it's better, I'm bringing this up now because it's actually better to go back and chisel after you're happy with the flora because if you chisel first, you're going to be trying to place flora and it's constantly going to be, you know, hitting floating blocks. So really, without sort of drowning you in detail, that's pretty much it. Um, from here, it's a good idea to go away for a little while and come back with fresh eyes. Um, then, you know, walk around a bit, fix up any little details, add and remove flora section by section. If then you want to go start adding other stuff, now's the time. So I ended up turning this space, after it was terraformed, into the Hammerhood Festival. So it was inspired obviously by that notice board competition, but um, it was a really fun idea in the end. Um, so look, obviously that 
video was huge and I really honestly don't know quite how to end it because there's so much in it. Remember, there are timestamps in the description. Um, I hope it made sense and I'm totally open to any feedback about how I could improve. I've not edited a video so long and so detailed before, so, you know, it's all a, a learning process. Um, I'm going to work on Canto for a little bit. Um, I'll get some stuff together for some more videos in a few days, but I would love to hear from you guys about anything specific that you would like to see. Um, otherwise, I might just pick some architecture stuff to do. For anyone who did make it this far, thank you so much. Um, I'll just let the last 30 seconds of this Hammerhood Festival play out, but hopefully I can see and talk to you all soon. And like I said, if there's anything you want to talk to me about, just hit me up. All right, bye.